to ask our uh, neuroscientists, we want to know during different functions, which neurotransmitter, chemical, in chemical perspective of view, what type of neurotransmitter was released and uh, in which brain area and the, for, and the release for how long or how fast. We call it dynamics of the neurotransmitters. Everything is unknown so far. I pick up the DNA sequence of our dopamine sensors, inserted it into the embryos of the fruit fly, and, uh, as, and I raised up the embryo and got the transgenic animal, the fruit fly, with our sensor in its brain. I come up with an idea that the fruit fly loves fruit. So, firstly, I just give the fly the smell of the fruit, as you mentioned, banana. So, I, when, I, when the fly smell the, uh, smell the banana, I, I, it, I, I find the, there is a flash in my screen. I can, I can look at those fluorescent signals with my naked eyes without any imaging process. The fluorescent signal is relatively big, and uh, th 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 that's cool. And uh, that must have been a big aha moment for yes. a scientist. Of yeah, that's it. Wow, that yeah. is the first aha moment in my graduate's career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Interesting. Identify the whole connectome. Record the whole connectome uh -huh. and then manipulate manipulate the yeah. whole connectome yeah okay cool you guys heard it here get building on that <laughs> i love it you can work on that in the future yeah <laughs> please yeah yeah no someone's opinion may contradict yours where's my friend alan it's all about your perspective who are we and what is the nature of this reality Ni hao everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakyan. We are on site in the beautiful Beijing, China at Peking University School of Life Sciences. We are now going to be talking to Big Tree. Hi Alan, hello everyone, I'm Big Tree. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on our show, Big Tree, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> so excited for our conversation. For those that don't know Big Tree's bio, he's a graduate researcher at the Lee Lab at Peking University School of Life Sciences using cutting edge neurobiology to study memory. And you can find the links in the bio below. Okay Big Tree, let's start things off by asking one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Our direction of our world, if you mean that it, the whole human community, I think our direction is on the Mars. <laughs> the next colonist place for us, because uh, recently I'm writing the uh, bio biography of Elon Musk, so he pointed out that our next direction is the Mars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is it Ashley Vance's, his writing? Um, um, yes. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. That book. Yes. The, yeah. Did the, you read that? It's such a good book. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good book. It's a very inspirational book. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Why? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. So, so what is our direction since till the time since we are still on the Earth? Um, Personally, I think we need to enjoy our life and uh, taking our responsibility, support myself, support my family, and if I got a bigger power, I can support my friend and then like you and um, for our whole society or for our whole community, uh, making it a better world to living yeah Th that is our goal yeah yeah i love the mentality of of being pure and being love and achieving some sort of a our own maximal potential that earns us some power that we can wield health in a healthy way and also 
in a way that enables us to earn and then fulfill ourselves, our families, our communities, our country, and the world at mm-hmm. large. Like I love that mentality. And it's also interesting that you pick Mars because <laughs> that you pick that answer because we have so many grand challenges to figure out on Earth and we have to also be careful to not just export the same problems to Mars. Yes. And that requires a lot of human evolution and consciousness ascension before we can really, in a healthy way, be able to colonize another celestial body, although it is a great idea to to continue the process of, of doing so uh, as we scale civilization and hopefully have billions of more people that are able to enjoy consciousness, creativity, meaning, all these types of things. What about your journey? You know, my, yes, yeah, let's talk my about personal this. journey. Your personal you. journey, where, where were you born? Um, How did you pick up your interest in science? Huh. So I was born in Chongqing, southwestern part of China, and um, I'm very proud to be a Chongqing artist. That is such a beautiful city, and uh, 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 we are famous for hot food, hot pot, and we are famous for our spicy food, and I love them. I cannot, I cannot live live my life without without chili actually I I, I, lo- I, lo- I eat spicy food every day so uh, even when I live in Beijing so uh, I was born there and I my first 80 years I just go to the kindergarten primary school middle school and, and high school and I after the college entrance exam, I pick up my next station in Hunan University. In how, how did you get your interest in science, though, when you oh. were younger? Because yeah, because you ended up studying science in college. But how did you, you know, how did you know that? So I, I, I did not know. Um, I picked biology as my major in my university. Because at that time, I do. I actually I don't have too much understanding of what is science are but I don't know what I don't want I do not want to study for my career or in my in my future because um, it's very interesting um, my 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 family work in uh, like my grandpa works as a journalist like you mm-hmm. to interview a lot of persons mm-hmm. and my mother is the editor for a newspaper mm. so um i know of the work of the works what they do and uh, and but i actually i don't know too much about the science and the uh, engineering i just want to uh, open my heart heart on in at that stage i want to look at how the world the world works in in the scientific way or in the engineering way so i pick up uh the biology as my major and there are you know there are other um there are other majors like the math like the physics chemistry and uh, and also our en- engineering field and why i do not pick those uh, feel that's my major because uh, f- firstly math and uh, physics is very difficult <laughs> I, I must admit that mm-hmm. they are difficult and uh, when I was in middle school or in high school I'm good at biology and I still think it is complicated the most complicated things in the whole universe how there so far people only find life in, on our earth instead of other planet so life is complicated and uh, there is a lot of things to be answered and uh, so it moved to my so i select biology as my major and what is even complicated in our life that is our brain how the uh how a lot of neurons talking together to each other and then fulfill our emotion, our logic, and uh, our soul, and, I mean our spirit. 
Okay, so so uh, so my uh, after uh, got the bachelor degree uh, in biology in my university, I want I uh, so in my graduate school I selected the neuroscience as my uh, uh, as my interest to do further studies. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that um, I I. Uh, I attend a summer school in Peking University when I was a sophomore year graduate student. And uh, at that time, um, I need to pick which field you are interested in. Firstly, I did not pick the neuroscience field. A lot of selections, like the structural biologists, which our neighbor Tsinghua University is very good at. And uh, the, second, um, um, the second direction is the stem cell. The, the, at that time, the IPS just got the Nobel Prize. So stem cell is very, uh, is very hot at that time. And the third topic is the neuros neuroscience. So firstly, I pick up the stem cell as my first choice. But, but, it, uh, but uh, at that time, I, at that summer, I got an internship study in the, I need to do wide field study in the, in another area of China. I cannot go to Beijing at that time. So I talked to the, I talked to the uh, TA whether I can change another direction. So there is only a slot left in the neuroscience field. So I pick up the neuroscience. <laughs> that, that, that is how it work goes for me. And uh, so I pick up the neuroscience as my direction at that summer school and I need to select a PI to read his papers and uh, come uh, and uh, have dinners with the PI and even visit the lab and I got internship uh, uh, experience in the lab. So at that time there you know there is a huge there, there is a lot of PIs in the neuroscience field in Peking University, and uh, a lot of them are very famous and uh, successful, like Yi Rao, and like Zhuan Zhou, like Chen Jian Li, and uh, a lot of PIs. And um, Yu Long just start that is in 2013. Yu Long just start his lab at 2012, so he's very young PI. So uh, people, people just. Um, people just because uh, I am the person who switched to this direction. So a lot of the very famous and successful PIs has been selected as by other students. So I have no choice. <laughs> so Yulon is the only one who got. So I got the only slot from the neuroscience direction, and I got the only slot from Yulon's lab. <laughs> so so I come to know with Yulon and. Uh, now his study and uh, f and in my graduate school, I his he becomes my PhD advisor. So I already work with him for um, more than five years. So that that is my way. That that is how I go to the lab and then go to the graduate school and uh, start my study and. Yes, and why I'm interested in biology yeah. and neuroscience. Yeah, and on a trajectory to tackle the potentially the most complex thing that we know of in the universe, <laughs> what's happening in the human brain. And maybe, uh -huh. maybe uh -huh. on the process of going through building tools, which we're going to talk about on tackling this big challenge, we can do massive things like augment our health, extend our longevity, make ourselves smarter, make ourselves more knowledgeable, less ignorant, all this type of stuff. Okay. It's funny, the last slot, the last slot, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's good that, you know, PKU is just, this has, like you were describing, there's just so many really great PIs here and you have, um, a really good opportunity to be doing what could be um, worldwide, world-class research that worldwide makes a big influence on other people picking up and using the tools, which is huge. Let's talk about uh, the the first part of your work. When was the um, the work your work with GPCR? 
the G protein coupled receptors? When was the first one, the dopamines that, mm, so um, my first one, when I joined the lab, our lab just start the new project developing GPCR based neurotransmitter sensors. So shall I talk about something about why we need that or? Exactly, let's actually even, let's take, let's baby step our way through this so first is G protein coupled receptors, GPCR, <laughs> a large protein family of receptors that detect molecules outside the cell yes. and activate internal signal transduction pathways, the cellular response. So outside of the cell are GPCR receptors yes. that then take information from outside the cell to trigger the cell's mm -hmm. response, mm -hmm. gene expression, these mm -hmm. types of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, and apparently Ulong was teaching us on the show, 40 to 50% of all FDA approved drugs are targeting the GPCR receptors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a very important, I mean, triggering cellular response is crucial in biology and neuroscience. So. Yeah, walk us through some of the yeah the GPCR stuff to start, and then yeah, why? Let's talk about why that's important first. So um, our brain is not like it's complicated. It's not like other tissues. Some thing happens in the cells that can explain how we uh, how everything goes, like in the stem cells. Or in the, or in our like uh, other systems, circular systems, or some other things. What make our brain ma magic is that the brain consists of a lot of neurons, and they no neuron is working alone, but they work together. So communication is the most critical function of our nervous system of our neurons. And the neurons need to communicate, so the major media is, the, is neurotransmitters which released from the upstream, we call it presynaptic neuron, release the neurotransmitters to the postsynaptic neurons, and the postsynaptic neuron receives the signal and knows what's going on, what's the, what's the order, and what I need to do in the next step. So this is we call it synaptic transmission, and the, the receptors f for all of the neurotransmitters we uh, in our body, we have a specific receptor, that is the GPCR receptors. So basically, GPCR defines the major communication function of our brain. So study GPCR is quite important, but um, and now people have no idea uh, in the living animals when and where, uh, and as actually there are more than 100 types of neurotransmitters has been identified, and that there are even larger group family of the corresponding GPCR receptors. And uh, so more than 100 neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters have been identified? identified? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. But, but you can apply like the Pareto distribution, like a power law distribution. You can say that 20% of the, of the uh, neurotransmitters account for 80% of all neurotransmission, like majority of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, etc. Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. And like the, there's like the long tail, uh -huh. which is very small occasional uses. Uh -huh, uh -huh. of the other 80% they yes. are rarely yeah, used. Yeah, that's the truth. Okay, okay. So uh, there are some major transmitters and uh, as you said, uh, some things are less used in our brain by all of them. So, so in the chemical aspect of view, our brain is so complicated. Even the communication is so complicated. So, um, so we want to still, uh, so a lot different neurotransmitters get involved in different uh, brain functions. Like when you are thinking, you are looking at me, mm -hmm. and uh, you are 
uh, you are nodding, everything is, is, uh, is controlled by your uh, nervous system. So different uh, neurotransmitters uh, get involved in different functions and, uh, and so to us, our uh, neuroscientist, we want to know during different functions, which neurotransmitter, chemical, in chemical perspective of view, what type of neurotransmitter was released and uh, in which brain area and the, f for, and the release for how long or how fast we call it dynamics of the neurotransmitters. Everything is unknown so far. So, so, so we want to know how can we detect those neurotransmitters. Yes. Uh, uh, um, actually, some uh, uh, the the electrophysiologist or the chemist uh, chemist already developed some technologies to detect the neurotransmitters in, in, in human brain or in the mode, brain of motor organisms. And, but unfortunately, they, are, um, they lack some sort of temporal resolution because they collect the sample like in every five minutes or 10 minutes. That is much more slower than your thinking, oh, yeah. than your logic. And, uh, and uh, so, so some of them lacks the temporal resolution. Some of them lacks the uh, spatial resolution because they need to insert a relative big electrode into the brain to detect those signals. So the brain, uh, so those electrodes are uh, uh, much bigger than the neurons, or even comparing the synapses which is uh, much more smaller than the neurons. So the electrodes are too big, so we don't know exactly where this different neurotransmitter released. So uh, in the aspect of temporal resolution, spatial resolution, there is also chemical identities. As I mentioned, more than 100 neurotransmitters was involved in different functions. So people lack the technology to identify the transmitter type just based on their electro or chemical feature, uh, electrophysiological feature or electrochemistry features. So biology question need to answer by biology tools, biological tools. So that is what we think why we start as our biologists, what we can do to develop new tools to answer these old questions. Mm -hmm. so, um, so our nature has evolved for billions of years and uh, we got those neurotransmitters and we also evolved their corresponding receptors. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is how the in how the nature detects different neurotransmitters. That is the GPCRs. So we focus on their native receptors to develop our native detectors. That is our basic logic. And so what, uh, so the GPCR um, um, from previous studies, people already got Nobel Prize for solving the structure of GPCR. And people found that when specific neurotransmitter bind with the GPCR, the GPCR just tweet a little bit. Mm. That we call it conformational change. Yeah. And we, we, we expected that if we can, if we can attach a, just a fluorescent protein into this GPCR, and uh, during the, the tweeting of the GPCR, the fluorescent protein tweet with it, yes. and the, there might be we can there might be some fluorescent change. Yeah. And in this way, we transfer a chemical signal into a, a light signal, yeah. so uh, we can detect it by the very cutting edge imaging tools. Yes. Uh, like the two photon, confocal, or a lot of new image cutting, light shade 
a lot of imaging tools. Yes. Ooh, okay, so let's... Did I talk too much? <laughs> so good. Such a good breakdown for us. Very good breakdown. Okay, so let's start with this point. So we were talking about how we have GPCR receptors on the outside of cells and on the outside of the neuron, especially on the, uh, the postsynaptic side. Mm -hmm. uh, on, so on the receiving end of the neurotransmission, there has to be GPCR receptors because they detect the neurochemical. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you guys figure out how to add fluorescence to the GPCR receptor. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Through what? Through what engineering? Through what engineering enables the, uh, yeah. Oh, that, um, so that is what we call um, protein engineering work. That is the multiple, most critical uh, process during a sensor de development. Mm. We pick up, we, we pick up those, we amplify those genes which encode the GPCRs from our human genome, from our human DNAs. We clone those stuff, use a technology called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We got the DNA encoding those GPCR, and then we can use some enzymes to split it into like two or three different segments and then you got some slot to do and and you got you like you got like one slot if you cut it uh, you cut it this way you got one slot and then I clone we clone the fluorescent protein from um, jellyfish yes from jellyfish the green fluorescent proteins from the jellyfish, the red fluorescent proteins from the coral. So we clone the fluorescent protein from the coral or from the jellyfish, and we got the DNA fragment, and uh, we insert the DNA fragment into the GPCR slot, and uh, these three parts comes together, was sealed by some enzymes, and uh, we, in this way, we got the whole DNA sequence for a uh, neurotransmitter sensors. Actually, um, you you cannot just do it that way and got a very perfect sensor with good expression level, with good fluorescence, even with good signal to noise ratio. You need to you need to engineer very carefully where to insert the fluorescent protein into the GPCR backbone. And you need to also engineer the linker, the, the linker protein or DNA sequence between them. That will define how efficient, how, how the efficient of the so-called conformational change transfer from GPCR to the fluorescent protein. There might be some linkers. So you need to tweak, uh, you need to do, we call it random mutation to those linker sequence to see which amino acid is the perfect. And after that, we also engineer some, uh, do some mutations within the GPCR. We call, uh, the, the uh, neurotransmitter is very small that will bind with some specific place within the GPCR, we call it binding pocket. And within the, the binding pocket, um, DNA sequence will, or amino acid sequence will define the affinity between sensor or between GPCR with the neurotransmitter. So we also engineer some sort of uh, specific site within the binding pocket to get the perfect sensor with, um, with good spatial, temporal, uh, uh, not, not, with fast kinetics, with good signal to noise ratio to transfer the uh, chemical signal into fluorescent signal. 
and uh, yes that is a lot of work if you are a, a first year graduate student just start to do such kind of we call it protein engineering you take like three days or two days and like three days to get such a construct and test it whether it works or not and uh, to get a perfect sensor probably you need to try more than 1000 alternatives to get a perfect construct and uh, you need to uh, that, that that is a lot of work but but we we figure out some way to do it parallelly so that can save some time but it's still a lot of work to, for a graduate student to got such a perfect sensor and uh, actually I'm very lucky when I joined the lab we already got those sensors some of our prior students in our lab already built those sensors and tested those sensors on the most simple uh, model culture cells artificial culture cells in the medium cells in the medium we tested those sensors and the, we already know that it works and what so so it turns to me I I take the job to create transgenic animals to test whether their the sensors can whether there's this sensor can be used for in vivo studies yes. in intact animals in the living brain during specific behavior so I took the fruit fly for science we call it Drosophila melanogaster to as an animal model fruit fly has been used at the model organism for more than at least 100 years from Morgan and who uh, got after genetic screen after mutagenesis he got the white eye fly, white white eye fly that I think that is a star of the fly genetics yeah. so people use fly to study the uh, to study the biology for a lot of years why people use fly that is because fly is very easy uh, so, uh, firstly fly is very easy to do genetic manipulations if you you cannot clone you cannot do gene manipulation on humans but if you want to create a transgenic mouse or rat it takes um, half half a year half a year to get such a transgenic animal if you want to um, do transgenic manipulation on higher model organisms like monkeys it takes several years like one several just several years to get a transgenic animal but if you want to test the fly within man, one month you can get thousands of different mutants Th that is very fast to study the biology from with genetic tools so we start from, and that is the first thing for, for the benefit to use fly as an animal model the second thing is that even for especially for our neuroscience field the fly brain is quite small mm -hmm. and uh, there is a less neuron in the brain and its brain is less complicated comparing with mammals mm -hmm. so it is a simpler model to study very conserved functions of of the nervous system which the things we shared between our humans with other animals even as small as the fruit flies like people already done a very beautiful a lot of beautiful work use fly in the nervous system to study like the circadian clock the daily life which shares between humans and flies and the first mutant of the circadian is identified by Simon Benzer at Caltech in 1970s in the fruit fly instead of human or rat or, or mouse so fly is a very uh, just perfect model algorithm to study nervous system uh, uh, to study conserved biological functions in the nervous system so uh, and uh, again for 
in the perspective of neurosensing, in the perspective of neurotransmitters, we share most of the major neurotransmitters. Our human has acetylcholine, uh, glutamate, GABA, dopamine, norepinephrine, adrenaline, and uh, all of those neurotransmitters exist in the fly brain and controls uh, major functions. So, so you have to then figure out how to engineer the the GPCR sensor to light the, up the fly brain for even a specific neurotransmitter. So, so you want to know when it's when you're receive when the neuro, when the neurotransmitter that you're receiving. Um, when you're sen when you're sensing dopamine versus serotonin versus norepinephrine et cetera, you need to know which one you the the fly yeah, you, uh, the what's fly flowing yeah 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 sure yeah. so so uh, you have to engineer the sensor the, to let you know which one so that way when you're so bringing the banana peel to the fruit fly and the fruit fly smells <laughs> the Banana peel because it's oh, like. Oh, already know that. <laughs> yeah, because that's you know just like with us too, we're very similar. When we smell some food, it's big yeah. neural activity happening because that's yeah, that's yeah. our that's how, that's our sustenance. That's how we live. That's how our genes can live on uh -huh. when we eat. So same thing in the food fly. But you have to know. We uh, have to you have to know what neurotransmitter is is, is being secreted being in flow in the in the brain's activity yeah yeah that's what i do i give uh so when i get into the lab we already got the first dopamine sensors probably the first one in the world so i pick up the f dna sequence of our dopamine sensors inserted it into the embryos of the fruit fly and uh, as and I raised up the embryo and got the transgenic animal, the fruit fly, with our sensor in its brain. So, so, so I need in the whole. No, not in the whole. How many neurons? How many has the sensor expressed? Mm, that 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 defines the. Firstly, I just test our sensors because it's a dopamine sensor. So I expressed our dopamine sensor in all of the dopamine nurturing neurons in the fly brain. And how many? How many? Let me see. Probably several hundred neurons. Several hundred. Neurons in and the fly brain. And you were all imaging several hundred neurons over time and spatially yes. with either two photon microscopy or con Oh, uh, confocal. Confocal microscopy. microscopy. Okay. Yes. Either one of those, or one of those work better for it. Um, for in vivo imaging in in animal brain, people usually use uh, two photon microscopy. Compare two photon can see much deeper in the brain comparing with the confocals. So, because uh, animal brain is relatively deep. So people use two photons. So it's very interesting. I got those transgenic animals expressing dopamine sensor in like several hundred dopamine neurons in the fly brain. And uh, at, first at first, I have no idea where should I look at where, whether there is really dopamine release in the fly brain and whether our sensor is capable to give us the fluorescent signal. So I have no idea. The, in the fl I just look at the screen of our microscope and cannot figure out what to do next. I can see some fluorescent signals, but there is no dopamine release, no fluorescent change. And uh, so I, I just, I, I, I come up with an idea that the fruit fly loves fruit. So firstly, I just, Give the fly the f smell of the fruit, as you mentioned, banana. So, I, uh, when I, when the fly smell the uh, smell the banana, 
I, I, it, I, I find the, there is a flash in my screen. I can, I can look at those fluorescent signals with my naked eyes without any imaging process. The fluorescent signal is relatively big. And uh, th 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 that's cool. And uh, that must have been a big aha moment for yes. a scientist of yeah that is, wow that yeah. is the first aha moment in my graduate's career <laughs> yeah, yeah that's beautiful so um, and uh, actually it is not all of the dopamineergic neurons or all of the sensors in the fly brain it's just um, like subset like several like less than 100, less than 100 neurons in the fly brain get activated. And uh, I just look at those signals with my naked eyes. And uh, when I come back to my computer to analyze those signals, and I found, oh, those sensors really work. So it's the first time we got to know that our sensor can not only be used for culture cells, but also to study the real biology how animals smell things. Yes, and it's as, it's complicated, but it's also as simple as taking the genetically encoded sensor and embedding it in the embryo of the fruit fly. Mm -hmm. And then having that embryo divide and divide, mm -hmm. and, divide and divide and divide and divide and make the fruit fly, thousands of the fruit fly, uh -huh. because they multiply really fast after you have one yeah, okay. that breeds. Because the fruit fly um, give, uh, uh, will make new babies, and uh, all of the new babies carry the our same. new sensors. They carry the sensors. Yes. Wow. And so then after just a couple months, you have thousands of flies with, with our your just sensors, okay. Yes. And then the fly has to, you know, be that that safe glue has to be used to keep it on the on the foil or the paper so that oh, you can I, I think you must talk with some fly person previously. Do you Du Long mentioned it on the show. Oh you have to have a safe, non harmful glue. <laughs> Yes. To keep the fruit fly on the... Uh, on a, we call it chamber, the imaging chamber. The imaging chamber. Yeah, to mount the flies. Mount the flies. And we use... We choose tweezers to open yeah. a very small window on the fly's head and uh, expose the brain but do not touch and do not hurt the brain. Keep the brain intact and... Uh, let the fly think er everything it wants to think. Yeah, so, freely. so you can use very small tweezers to open the fruit fry's brain just a little bit. And not, not just a little bit? Um, quite a bit, but I, not I, 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 I do not touch I do not touch the brain. I, yeah. I, op I you open. cut up the cuticle or yeah. the skin of the, the head. skin of the head. And uh, expose, the, the, expose brain the brain so that the two photon microscopy can go past the skin yes. more easily to the brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the yeah. bananas brought up. Yes. And then you are looking at the two photon microscopy and then you see the as the fruit fly smells the tiny little piece of the banana uh -huh. you see the fluorescence of about a hundred or so of your yeah lights up light lights up uh -huh. of the neurons yes that have the dopamine sensors yes. attached to them that yeah. you've yeah. genetically uh encoded these sensors from the embryo until th th that's how th this is uh this is an excellent scientific advancement that has uh, so much potential. Huh, thank you. Because, <laughs> yes, because yes, one big problem in previously that when pe people also want to detect the different, like do even dopamine signals in the fly brain, people uh, can use electrophysiology method 
to record the electrical signals from single neuron. But as I mentioned, there are a lot of neurons in the fly brain and people cannot record it one by one because it takes a lot of time to do even one recording. And uh, if you want to go through all of the neurons, it's almost impossible. But for image method, we can just open a window and uh, look at all of the neurons at the same time. And uh, f within several seconds, we can know which one is working, which one is not, is silent. And uh, we can do it all, of, we can record all of different neurons parallelly. That is the benefit of the imaging comparing with previous electrochemical method. And, uh, and uh, the imaging has, uh, has uh, so you can put, say the image method has high throughput. And uh, in the, mm, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Now, now, now you, you want to create sensors for all of the other important especially neurotransmitters yes okay yeah that's what i'm doing and i already uh, i think our sensors already cover major neurotransmitters in exist in the fly brain including dopamine serotonin acetylcholine and uh, the adrenaline of the fruit fly called octopamine and uh, now we even switch to, uh, we, we, st we already start to develop other, other non-major neurotransmitters. We call it neuropeptide, mm. but they are very important. And uh, the neuropeptide contribute to like 80% of the neurotransmitters identified in the brain, but previous people just got no way to observe those, monitor those. And uh, it, we are very lucky because our method can be, trans uh, can be also adopted to develop sensors, not only for the major neurotransmitters, small, we call it small molecule neurotransmitters, but also for other types of neurotransmitters. And uh, this method is universal. So we are lucky now we are working on that to explain the, uh, the sensor palette. And uh, we want to cover as small as major, near, uh, as small as neurotransmitter as possible. Where else can the genetically encoded sensors for GPCR sites be useful because the brain is a very useful place for this. Mm -hmm. Can all other, of our other cells on our body also use the similar techniques for, especially pharmacology, if so many of the FDA approved drugs are for targeting GPCR receptors, sure. then sure. shouldn't we also have sensors on those GPCR receptor sites so that we know if the pharmacology is actually connecting with the targeted cells. Mm -hmm. That is what we are, that is one potential application for our sensors to screen for new drugs. Because during pharmacology, in, in, I know in the, in the pharmacologic field or in the companies, people want to screen for different drugs that can target GPCRs, as you mentioned, but what people are recording is actually the downstream signalings of native GPCR, because uh, uh, downstream of the uh, downstream signalings of different GPCRs, and then that takes time, and uh, and after and then that takes time. That is one uh, disadvantage, and the second ad disadvantage is that. People don't know um, uh, there is an amplification effect of the downstream signalings. So people don't know to what extent the GPCR is real activated or inhibited. So with our sensors, we attach the fluorescent protein onto different GPCRs 
and we got those sensor and this fluorescent protein just those fluorescent signal just come from the GPCR itself so we can quantitatively and to screen for the chemicals and the potential drugs which can activate or inactivate different GPCRs and in a very fast, uh, in a very high throughput. That is our benefit and the potential application of our sensor. And actually, we are, we are, we already started to try on that project. Excellent, excellent. It seems like especially with the vast amount of money that the pharmaceutical industry spends on drug design and development, that it would be really helpful to increase yeah. efficacy of yeah. knowing if they hit the targeted cells with your sensors. Yes. Yeah, using your sensors for that process. Now let's talk about the work with memory. Uh -huh. Sure. Because when the fruit fly mm -hmm. smells the banana, uh -huh and we see the neural activity and we map it spatially, temporally, uh -huh. then that becomes a memory that the fly holds. No. It doesn't. Interesting, okay. That is not the memory I mentioned. Okay, I, I think you mean is, what do you mean is more like Familiarity or familiarity. Yes. Okay. You you smell something and, and you smell it all the time and you just get desensitized with that smell and you no longer uh, pay attention to that smell. That we call a uh, familiarity. Well, maybe more so that my all of our collective human ancestry has for the last millions of years been smelling uh -huh. food and when we smell food from a million years ago we figured out okay i smelled this food it tastes good oh oh oh, oh. then several hundred thousand years ago i smell it tastes good ten thousand years ago i smell it tastes good you know even up until now Oh, you, we uh, still smell it, it tastes good. So it's like <laughs> literally encoded in millions oh, of years of memory. Oh, you, mean the, you mean the native preference to a smell which is evolved during the history, during human mm. evolutions. Mm. And that is one kind of memory encoded, uh, we can call it a native memory. Encoded and, in and your in, gene. And in I, this I, case, I, I, it would I, I, no. also be a native memory encoded in the fruit fly, right? Yes, this okay. native uh, memory will also encode in the fruit fly. That is why a fruit fly called fruit fly, because yeah. they like fruit. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so uh, what I call is, um, we, I'm studying the uh, associative memory. That's a lot more complicated. Yes. Yeah. Um, Our brain works so much differently than a computer does in the sense of associative memory versus storing a file in a very specific place <laughs> that can only be accessed by going to that specific place in the computer memory. Whereas with us, it's so associative. Yes. If I start talking about my visit to Peking University, I'll start thinking about all of the science you were teaching, all of the people that I was meeting, all of the culture I was experiencing. Yes. So associative. Yeah, that, that is the associative memory. So um, the fruit fly is not as dumb as you think. The fruit fly is relatively smart. And uh, the fruit fly can link a smell with um, with uh, previous experience and uh, if the experience is harmful or it's a punishment the next time after the uh, uh, after con uh, bridging the connection the next time when the fly smell the same odor it knows to get a void from that and if the experience is something good like the food the fly learns to get approached to that odor this phenomenon has been identified for um, like more than 50 years, half, half century, by uh, Simo Bender, a professor in Caltech in 1970s. 
and the people study this field for uh, half, after half century study, people already know that a lot of neurotransmitters take part in this critical function. Inclu among them, including dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, octopamine, all of the neurotransmitters, we already got sensors. Yeah. <laughs> and we did not intentionally in create our sensor t to fit this specific neural circuitry, but now we pe previous people know that flies with with abnormal neurotransmitters like dopamine serotonin, it cannot form such type of associative memory, or the they forget uh, more quicker, or they, uh, or they, when you see it has deficit in long-term memory, or they just can can only remember the good things but cannot remember the negative things. So uh, the fly experience different deficit of associative memory with the loss of different neurotransmitters. People already know that from behavior studies um, to test whether the fly go or no go to different smell. Mm. So, but no one has ever know which, when, and where does different neurotransmitter was released, even yes. during the association yeah. and uh, during the uh, memory recall. Um, and this is really interesting for a lot of our current uh, neurological diseases, uh, specifically like depression and uh, anxiety and and ADHD, PTSD. Yes, uh, it, 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 it's what we created is just a PTSD in the fly brain, and we want to see what happens. During the PTSD, during the PTSD happening, yeah. and what happens when the fly just experience it once again? How to we try, we call it retrieve those memories in their brain, yeah, in their deeper mind. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It it seems as though uh, if a if, if we can approximate that a human to a monkey to a mouse to a fish to mm -hmm. a fruit fly mm -hmm. is at least somewhat similar, there may be a, a pretty serious discovery awaiting us that says something along the lines of, If there is a lack of neurotransmission occurring where there is supposed to be, when it's supposed to happen, for especially when you're doing some sort of a task that usually gets you neurotransmission, like a reward, like a behavior that mm -hmm. usually gets you a reward. Mm -hmm like in the case of people with depression it's like if you get out of the house and go and exercise or go and read a book or go and do something meet with friends do something that is drives you closer to your goals if you're not getting the same neurochemical flows that you should be that's a big problem mm -hmm. that's it yeah that's that's why we run to study this phenomenon because the associative memory um, is just so it's the learning ability is some critical ability um, shared um, ex just push our human life or push our his history forward so and uh, we and uh, what is very interesting that all of those chemical, chemicals used in the fly brain to form 
the memory or to forget a specific memory is just um, conserved between humans with the flies and the, the humans also use things like dopamine, serotonin and the acetylcholine to code the memory, to form the memory and uh, so the study in the fruit fly will give us a lot of hint of what's going on in our brain and uh, how we can treat ourselves in case of anything bad happens. If our memory encoding system is having issues with neurochemical flows, then there may be a much better specifically targeted way of doing stimulation to reintroduce those original neurochemical flows to continue people in the direction of when I do something when I'm supposed to get a neurochemical release then I actually get it. Mm -hmm. And st brain stimulation is a very interesting field that has a lot of you know ultrasound, electrical stimulation, magnetic stimulation, a lot of interesting Very careful stimulation is very important. Um, very precise stimulation is very important. But healing people is very important. Healing people. Mm -hmm. Bringing people back to their, 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 their healthiest and most creative flow states mm -hmm. of being is very important. Sure. Do you, do you feel like that's like one of your main reasons why you're studying? Like what are the main reasons why you are studying the memory? Uh, like healthy and happy for humans or what? My study of memory because it's just curious, I drive by curiosity, the memory created the person, defines our, defines our identity, defines who we are. People cannot, uh, can, cannot connect itself with, if people cannot connect it, itself with previous experience, People just feel lonely and they feel abandoned by the world or by the community. Because like something, like you know the people will, with Alzheimer's disease, people forget everything it just experienced. Yeah. And uh, th that's sad. And, and so for people lost the memory, we, I don't know what's the feeling of a loss of memory, but I know what's the feeling when I face a person who lost his memory, the AD, and the AD patients, uh, and uh, just my grandma, and uh, I feel. Uh, I have no way to help her, but that's sad because the current science cannot help people with AD, but I want probably there is a way to figure it out by the study of how memory was formed, how memory was lost. And uh, I do not want to ex have that experience when I getting old. And, uh, Possibly that is a deep drive of why I'm pursuing that question. Yeah. And you know, we like to use the analogy of the library. You have the big library in your in your brain, and that you 
experience in neurodegeneration and the library books are on fire in the library and you're <laughs> losing big volumes of yes of memory and you know sleep is another really good way to understand memory that everything that we experience today we sleep so that we can integrate everything today with our last for me 26 years of my life mm -hmm. and that when you have issues with sleep or when you have issues with encoding memory you lose it would be so cool for for us to could we could we remember all of the cool things that we experience today but no we're not we're only going to experience we're only going to remember certain key things yes. from today yes. that we're going to encode with our last 26 years mm -hmm. but what if i wanted to come back to the exact part in this interview from you know well we have <laughs> we have our recording of it which enables us to do exactly that come back to this exact point uh -huh, that's uh -huh. why we do things like record great conversations so we can do exactly that and share it uh -huh. but if we weren't recording it and i really wanted to come back to that sentence or that paragraph that you said that was really inspiring to me mm -hmm. to for me to be able to go back for us to be able to have really cool recording of our entire day if our entire life stream of memory mm -hmm. and to be able to go back fast forward rewind pause it's very interesting i like that a lot and it can more easily be stored that content then the entire life of big tree <laughs> or the entire life of even your grandmother before the neurodegeneration happens that we could capture her memories mm -hmm. and then be able to go back and like see what life was like for her oh you know and that type of it's, it's a pretty interesting field of uh, upcoming study with memory and and the retention of knowledge and the transmission of knowledge over time mm -hmm. yeah. yes that, that's very important interesting and I think what we want to keep is what you mean keep the memory or keep the moment is keeping the state of how the neurons are connected now. Interesting. How they're uh, connected and what is transmitting uh, the how chemicals. How Basically the chemoelectroconnectome. Yes. Okay. Yes of that exact time period that we were talking about, those exact 15 seconds of you reading that paragraph. Yes. I need the chemo electroconnectome of that 15 second period. Yes, probably and you can cl click, this. click the play button and then, <laughs> oh, that's what I felt like. <laughs> probably that's a way how you can go back and lose, uh, just feel exactly the same way and see the things here, the things feel in the wind, the air, the smell. Yeah. That's the way. Interesting. How neurons communicate and yeah. how you feel. Yeah. Okay. What about your ideal neuroscience tool? Oh, my mm. ideal neuroscience tool. We were just talking about like this, you know, chemoelectroconnectome, right? Or what would be your ideal neuroscience tool that would help you do exactly what we are striving to achieve in the field of neuroscience? Maybe 50 or 100 years down the line, what will that tool look like that will enable us to do everything that we want today with neuroscience? That must be, there must be one, only one tool for as the best tool to study the neuroscience questions. For such kind of tool, firstly, you keep the whole brain intact, but you can get the whole information of the activities of different neurons with, without any perturbation. You don't need to open the brain. You don't need to um, you, you don't need to cut a window, 
and you just got all of the neuron activity, all the chemical flows in the brain simultaneously from every neuron. And in, on the top of that, you got the identity of which neuron you are looking at. The identity, what I mean the identity, is the genetic background of the neuron which gene it, it expressed and uh, which uh, RNA it transcribed. And with that, you already know, you can do all of the recording things. And plus another thing, you need to, you ca can get access to manipulate every activity. You can either turn on the neuron, turn off the neuron, and uh, or turn thousands or billions of neurons simultaneously mm. to see whether you can you can drive a real function with the activity of a combination of, of the matrix of the neurons. So that that, that is a that, so for such kind of tool, so l let me summarize it. <laughs> you need to know the identity of the cell, where it is, and uh, which gene, which RNA it transcribed and expressed, and then you can record every neural activity, and then you can manipulate every neural activity. Yes. Yes. But there is no such a tool. <laughs> yeah. I like that ideal tool, yes. Yeah. It gives us that big vision. But actually, people push our current human technology from this three aspect um, orthogonally. But no, there is no such a tool which can give you even two types of function together. No one. No such kind of tool. No, they can even do two of those. No. I don't think so. Isn't, isn't no. there something that no. is doing both readout of electrical activity and stimulation? Nothing's doing both right now? Readout and uh, manipulation, people can achieve such kind of stuff with two te combined two Te-tech technologies, technologies together. but you have to combine two. Yes. But okay, interesting. But to turn that into even one, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. And what was the third one? Third one, cell identity. Identify, mm -hmm. record and manipulate. Record and manipulate. Yes. Interesting. Identify the whole connectome, record the whole connectome, mm -hmm. and then manipulate. Manipulate the yeah. whole connectome. Yeah, okay. Cool. You guys heard it here, get building on that. <laughs> I love it. You can work on that in the future. <laughs> yeah, please, yeah, yeah. And orthogonally, I like that, at the same time, tackling <laughs> it at the same time. How can we inspire more people around the world to work together? Learn English. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> that is the first step for everyone to communicate. And after communication, and then you can work together. You can disagree, you can agree, but you know what to do next. But if you, do, if, if you don't talk to each other, there's nothing happening. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So <laughs> communication is crucial, yes, 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 yes. Uh, what will get off the people united to work for one goal and uh, to overcome our current challenge? I don't think there is such a su there is such a thing which can get everyone united and uh, keep and uh, work on one thing to overcome some problem. That is not the way how human or animal was designed to do. Every life lives for its own benefit. 
That is how Jean tells us to do, not for the others. You know, Jean is selfish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we just, we just, but the self achievement has different aspect. Someone achieved in the science, someone in business, someone in arts. So that makes how the how the earth a versatile place or the human community a versatile place and thrilled in different aspect and uh, that is why our earth are beautiful. Yeah. We are not sand where we got every colorful. We got colorful view, we got colorful life. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the overall meaning or purpose of life? What, what do you think? <laughs> May I ask your answer? Can you give me some inspirations? <laughs> Ones that I've really enjoyed are to understand the source code source code of our reality okay and then to maximize flourishing maximize creativity uh -huh, meaning uh -huh. consciousness uh -huh, uh -huh. and then to take that source code that we understand and create more life from that initial source code and let it evolve again to complexity. So complete the circle. Wow. Yeah. That's too complicated. In my mind, uh, the purpose of our life from the, from the nervous system, it tells us the purpose for life is just a seeking for dopamine. People want, people are trying to get reward from enjoying uh, simple things like enjoying the food, enjoying a love relationship, enjoying, uh, enjoying the very beautiful sight view, and uh, from a higher level, people work, people devote itself to the things they love and uh, to fulfill themselves. That is, uh, that is another addiction. Mm. Every addiction is a pursuit for dopamine. When there is no dopamine in, in your brain, you feel no meaning of your life. Th that's what I think. Interesting. Interesting. Even the most meditative people on the planet, do you think they still live Pers for dopamine? Sure, I think. Because they, they are pursuing some f like philosophy, wisdom, and uh, they are searching for some of this thing, the real meaning of the world and everything will make itself or make her make himself or make herself feel oh i'm the smartest person in the world that we call it self achievement and this, the, at that moment that you can if you put a grab sensor in its mind in his or her mind you will see there is a lot of dopamine <laughs> But the person may be doing it with no agenda. They may just be 
being meditative without the agenda to be the most enlightened uh -huh. person. You, you mean it m must be very silent and... Did I get to ask you, uh -huh. uh, maybe I did, why do you, why do you call it the grab sensor? Oh, the grab sensor, uh, it's because um, you can think we, we catch up the uh, dynamics of the different neurotransmitters in the brain. So grab is, um, is mimicking the, the behavior of catching some signals. Oh, the, so, okay, so you guys call your, your, your genetically encoded sensor that goes on the, the where the, G, the GPCR to fluoresce. Uh -huh. You guys call that grabbing because it's grabbing mm -hmm. the neurotransmitter mm -hmm. that's yes. coming. Yes. So you guys call it grab sensors. Okay, good to know, good to know, okay. And then, what's one skill that every child should know going into the exponential technology age? For the 21st century, Skill. Probably it's good to learn some coding. <laughs> it's learn some coding to 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 solve the problems which can not be solved with single hand. You need to think things synchronously and work things synchronously with a huge amount of data because we already got a huge uh, hundreds or thousands of gigabytes of data at the same time with our modern technologies we need to figure out a way to analyze that no matter it's light, it's sound, it's magnetic or it's anything, it's huge the only code can help you to solve that problem. And do you think that consciousness evolves from the biological process? Do you think it comes from somewhere and takes its seat? You mean the God versus the nature? You can describe it however you not want. What do you think <laughs> consciousness is and how do you think it originates? I don't think there is real so-called consciousness. There is just the connecting network of the nervous system. It, it processes information, it processes the common information and give out the output behavior that we call it reflex. And uh, every conscious, I think it's just can become um, explained as a reflect of our nervous system. And your how, but so the next question is how the connecting network are built for each different individual. So that depends on the previous experience. The appearance ex, ex, uh, shapes the connection pattern of your nervous system. And if there is another one, if there is another one who has exactly the same experience like you, and uh, it will give every 
output exactly the same like you. I, I think that is what you call conscious. It exists in our humans, but it also exists in lower animals, like invertebrates, even it exists in the plants. Mm -hmm. It's just reflect. Reflect, yeah. yeah. Do you think we have free will? I used to discuss this topic with my friend and I still have my point of no. I do not think everyone has a free will. Our will is, as I said, defined by the connection patterns of the brain and the brain is shaped by the experience and you don't, not, you do not you do not have an idea or give out a behavior by yourself, but defined by your previous experience. Mm. That is, you are doomed to think so or do so. Have the idea or give a behavior. Mm. Yeah. Millions of years of behavioral evolution for human and then billions of years for the microbes that live inside yeah. of us so yeah a slave to our behavioral patterns of biology over billions of years yes yeah and even our last 26 years of memory and decisions and our I, parents I still yeah. think our everything in life can be explained by chemical reactions by enzymatic activities by basic physics and uh, the combination of the biology, physics and chemistry defines our every behavior and even think and spirit. Everything can be explained even though we do not know exactly how they work together. We'll get to the source code soon and we'll be able to better explain every behavior. Hmm. By the biology, the chemistry. So the that de that depends on the development of new tools. That does depend on the development <laughs> of new tools. Yes. So please fund the lab and uh, other uh, labs around the world that are building the tools to do the scientific probing. Please. <laughs> exactly. What do you think is the role of love in life? Role of love in life. You need to come. Uh, you firstly, people. I'm not such a person who just grown up with a very defined direction of what I'm going to do in the future or next or as my career. So according to my experience, I think the way to find the love is to experience, to try, to confront with the exactly thing or exactly the person you want to stick on and, uh, and uh, and uh, you find, get along with the people or get along with the st cr stuff, you just feel, make you feel better. And you, so this is the thing you love. And people just try, try different things. Last question. Uh, so how about you? Are you the person who know what are you going to do before, even before you trying that? Do you believe something like the destiny? Yeah. Oh, you already know that before you test it. No matter how you get dis disappointed, like you want to pursue a girl, and uh, but she just 
don't like you and uh, will you just keep on keep on going and uh, do that I like the word destiny there's a lot of nuance to that word and some say that you come with a destiny you come with some sort of gift or gem to unleash into the world that you are born into. I like that. I think there's something very deeply true about that. You have, every one of us has a unique potential to bring to the world. It could be that we have some sort of free will in the sense of how much of that destiny do we actually get to, what percentage of it we actually get to. And then it could be that maybe whether you got to 90% of your destiny or 60% of your destiny, that maybe that that was already determined from the moment that you're born. These are interesting questions and that's why we ask them on the show. Uh huh. Yeah. Sure. The last question. Yes. What is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world is uh, life itself. The most complicated chemical and the uh, physical and the mathematical thing happens in s within such a, sh a short, t with such a short temporal resolution and with such a small spatial resolution. All those equations come together to build the life. Life is the most valuable thing. Everybody needs to treasure. Yes. Yes. Big tree. Yes. This has been such an enlightening episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show <laughs> and teaching us. Thank you. Ask me so much questions I have never think about. <laughs> That's so hard, even harder than the college interest examination. <laughs> oh, what a funny quote. We'll have to pull that quote. That's a good one. So many good questions. Harder than the college entrance examination. I love it. I love it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about cutting edge neuroscience tools. Have more conversations around GPCR, G protein coupled receptors, more conversations around studying memory, have more conversations around how to run these experiments and how to best understand that source code and make these scientific fundamental advancements. Check out the link in the bio below to Big Tree. Check out the link to yulonglilab.org as well. And support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. You can find our links to our Patreon, PayPal, cryptocurrency. You can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are below. Help us continue doing cool things like coming on site to great places like Beijing to conduct these interviews. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Okay, that's great. Wow. Thank that was, you. That's <laughs> really good. That was really good. Really? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. That's my yeah. first. Uh. Tons of just neuroscience knowledge and then tons of really good back and forth at the end around these complex questions. That was really good. Oh, yeah. thank you. So much good neuroscience explanation. You're a really good communicator. Good job. Really? In, Eng I in English, too. You're doing really well. 